Euler's formula is a very elegant representation between a polar notation of a of a vec of a unit vector and the cosine and sine of it. More specifically, Euler's formula describes the vector e to the i theta and says that e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. Now, I'm not going to prove this here because there's many, many pages of proofs that exist uh, in different sites that prove this uh, on the internet. So just look it up if, it's a, if you want to actually see the proof. But this is true. When you are moving, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the properties of this. Theta here represents a unit vector. Uh, this entire expression represents a unit vector that is theta degrees away, theta away in radians, um, or degrees, but we like radians. Theta radians away from this right hand over here. So if we have a vector that goes out to here and it's described with an angle theta, then e to the i theta, if it's unit length, if this is one, would describe that, that direction here. And as theta goes up, then you simply rotate more and more around the circle. And so if theta, again, this is where this is real and imaginary. So this is real axis here, and this is the imaginary axis here. And so you can imagine if theta is pi over two, then you've got pure imaginary. So e to the i pi over two gives you a real component of zero, cosine of zero, cosine of pi over two is zero, right? It's not going anywhere times i sine pi over two, which is one, and therefore you end up straight up at one. That works. So as examples, e to the i pi over two is equal to cosine pi over two plus i sine pi over two. This goes away, this just becomes one, which is equal to i one or one i depending on how you want to write it. 1j, j1, 1i, right? The vectors point straight up. Similarly, if we take e to the i pi, then we're going to get cosine pi plus i sine pi. Oops. And this is just negative 1. So that becomes negative 1. This goes away. And that makes sense because if we're at pi, right, this value is just negative one, the real value negative one, and there's no imaginary component. So it goes away and show and lo and behold, that works out as well. And this works out for any arbitrary angle that you might decide. There are some very interesting properties of e to the i pi and this expression. If you take the derivative of e to the pi i, e to the i pi, so the derivative with respect to theta, d d theta of e to the i theta, what are you going to get? You're going to get i e i theta. Okay, that's interesting. I will tell you, and I will leave it as an exercise for you to prove that the derivative of e to the i pi is another unit vector that is perpendicular to the vector here that we see. So if this was our theta, so if we had some vector here, let's draw a new axis, and we had some vector that represented this, this was our vector, ah, let's just leave it. That's our original vector. Then the derivative is going to appear perpendicular. It's going to be unit length. Ah, that's, I've already got yellow. Let's use green. Uh, let's use, yeah, let's use green. Then the derivative is going to be 
perpendicular to that. Why? Well, what, that's exactly what theta means, right? For some small delta change in theta, where is this vector going to move? It's going to move in a unit circle perpendicular, tangent to the circle. Thus I, thus I e to I theta must be a vector that's perpendicular. I mean, it's not starting there. It actually starts at the origin, but you can imagine it being the be, being lined up at the tip of this and show the direction of movement. And thus, for whatever circular movement that we have here, for wherever we are, we will continue to rotate around. That's pretty cool. What that means is you can come up with a new theta that internalizes this, um, this e to the i pi. In fact, if you were to think through, right, this is perfectly, this is, this is the vector that goes right here. Per, per, uh, parallel, uh, perpendicular, so that the, the angle between these two is pi over two. And thus, this angle is just, so this is also equal to e to the i theta plus pi over two. Also true. And so if you take the derivative of this again, what are you going to get? You're going to get an angle, you're going to get a vector that's now perpendicular to that one. And so it's going to point down. And if you take the derivative of another time, you're going to get an, you're going to get an angle that's looking down this way. And then if you take the derivative one more time, you're going to end up back where you were. Right, so one derivative, two derivatives, three derivatives, four derivatives, and you're back to where you started out. So what is true about this equation? The fourth derivative of e to the i theta is just equal to e to the i theta. It's a pretty cool trick, right? Because what you're doing is you're rotating by 90 degrees every single time and spinning around and coming back to where you started. And that has to be the case because well, that's the rate of change of, of those vectors because they're always moving perpendicularly, instantaneous delta, right? The, a tiny nudge in theta is going to mean a movement of that, vec of that vector in exactly the perpendicular direction. This concept is extremely useful because it helps us think about a lot of, a lot of sinusoidal representations as just this lovely complex term of e to the i theta. You understand this, and then you understand a lot of the ways that complex, complex representations of two parameters can be used, in particular things like impedance, and the phase of impedance will often be written out in something like this. You can put an r in front of this and have that be the magnitude and so we have an equivalent representation, right? For Z, if we're talking about impedance, we can write it down as R plus J X, or we can write it down as the magnitude of Z, which is just R squared, the square root of R squared plus X squared, times E, Right, this is the magnitude times e to the i theta, and theta is here the arctan of x over r, the reactance over the resistance. Now, the exact opposite of this is also true. If we have some, just just on the inverse manner, if we have some impedance z that's written out as, as Zm, right, or Z0 as the magnitude times e to the i theta, then we can write, switch it to the Cartesian representation, right, this representation, by just taking Z0 or Z magnitude, right, Z0 cosine theta plus Z0 
I, oops, I should put I in front or J, J, Z naught, sine theta. It's the same thing, right? So you can switch between these representations very easily because it's just like polar notation, but you've got this J in between that lets you then manipulate the phases very easily and spin around in a unit circle. This is Euler's formula and it's extremely useful for dealing with co complex properties like complex frequencies or complex impedances um, as we will see throughout these, throughout these, throughout this work.